Welcome to the land of bourbon and bad decisions. This is the Relentless Daring Podcast. I am your host, Tyler Morgan, and here we are engaged in the relentless daring pursuit of truth, justice, and American jackassery. Also, it is Labor Day weekend, my friends. Yes, yes, that wonderful weekend where on Monday we will celebrate labor unions. Yes, that's right. Another day devoted to the celebration of one Karl Marx. Karl! Yes, well, while he may not be directly responsible for Labor Day in the United States, a lot of the uh, a lot of the early labor unions they had a lot of uh, Marxist philosophy going around them, and this is one of those ways of. Well, I'll get into it when we get into the podcast. So we got, like I said, we're going over uh, the history of Labor Day. I got to look here. Um, earlier this week, there was a story about how, oh my God, Donald Trump is not going to let military kids born abroad become citizens. Oh no. And yeah, that's what we want. We'll have to get into. Uh, I'm going to go into. A little religious vindication where uh, high school tennis players who they they were forced to sit out through the championship or the, through the postseason for their school's tennis team because their religious beliefs they weren't supposed to do anything on Saturdays, which is when most of the postseason games were. So they were forced to sit out. And so I would be looking at that one. And this is a military one about a, uh, a National Guard major who shows up at a Biden rally in uniform and is caught on camera saying that she's praying that he beats Donald Trump. Ladies and gentlemen, this is what we are dealing with in the military today. But, hey... It is what it is. However, I am we'll have to. Uh, I am going to address, you know, her violation of the Hatch Act. So get get right to it right after this. All right, so like I said, this first story, the, this article comes out of Task and Purpose, which the reason I'm with Task and Purpose is because I'm going to be coming back to it in here in a little bit. Now, for any of you who doesn't know, Task and Purpose, they are a military-oriented site, uh, news site, usually deals with, you know, policy stuff and any kind of a major news releases uh, changes to promotion systems uh, new policies stuff like that when it comes to military branches and so uh, this story is, uh, came out a couple days ago it's uh, from uh, the headline reads, Army National Guard Major under scrutiny after telling Biden she's praying he wins 2020 presidential election. All right. Jeff Shogel, the author. You could uh, make your headlines a little, uh, little less. What was Seal saying? Less is more. Instead, you gave us a mouthful. A whole paragraph. But I digress. To his article... A major with the South Carolina Army National Guard has highlighted military struggles to remain apolitical in an intensely partisan environment by telling former Vice President Joe Biden that she is praying that he wins the 2020 presidential election. Uh, I'm not going to give her name. Because, I mean, she has enough that she's dealing with as she's being investigated but basically, she's the synopsis of the story is that she shows up at a political rally, which, 
according to Uniform Code of Military Justice, according to the Hatch Act, and according to other Army U.S. Army policies, as a soldier, you are allowed to attend political rallies. However, you are not allowed to attend them in uniform, nor as a service member, or sir, let me rephrase this, nor are you allowed to endorse a candidate as a service member. You know, so you can't come out and say, I'm Sergeant Billy Bob Bunker, uh, United States Marine Corps, and I endorse Donald J. Trump for President 2020. You cannot come out as this major did and be at a political rally telling the presidential candidate that you're praying they win while in uniform. Now, I, I don't have an issue if she were to be at at the rally. If she was in civilian clothes and someone recognized her and said, oh my gosh, she's a major in the National Guard. And she doesn't support the Republican president. You know, that would be it's ridiculous. I understand. There's people of all walks of life, all political stripes in the military. I've known guys who are stark raving liberals progressives who lean towards statism and yet they were in the military upholding and defending the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies foreign and domestic and bearing true faith and allegiance to the same but they're they support ideologies that run counter to that very document sorry I'm just, I don't have a I don't have a sound of me scratching my head. But any who's I mean, I said, there's you know, you have the the people who are in the military they believe you know, they're anarchists. People will band together to protect each other. We don't need the state to do it for us. You know, maximum the absolute maximum freedom with zero government institutions to you know protect and secure those rights that they have as individuals they believe that they will be you know be able to do it themselves and they said you have the whole the whole span and granted the majority the majority of the US military is right of center. But, you know, you do have the outliers. I remember I served with a medic who he openly admitted he voted for Barack Obama because he wanted to be able to say that he voted for the first black president. Needless to say, Doc did not uh, get a whole lot of love for those comments, but it is what it is. But at the same time, again... Making any kind of major political statement or a an endorsement of a candidate while in uniform or as or while touting your current service in the United States military and actually in within the US government period that you know According to the Hatch Act, if you even if you're a federal civilian employee, you are not supposed to be. Well, I'm a federal. Sir, I'm a federal employee, and I am telling people they need to vote for this guy. Yeah, that's again, that's against the law. So, do I think anything's really going to come out of this? I don't know, uh, because. Was it a couple months ago when Donald Trump went to Japan and they had the USS John McCain there? There were uh, service mem- there were members of the uh, of the McCain. I think they're on the McCain. I- I'd have to really dig more into it. There were 
air crew members, yeah, it was McCain, that they had tabs made to go on their uniforms that said, Make Air Crew Great Again. Okay, there are some who viewed that as an endorsement of Donald Trump and his policies. I think it's just a bunch of airmen who were being funny. Hey, the president's coming here. He said, make America great again. Let's make air crew great again. I like that. I can get behind that. I can see that I can get behind it as just being a snarky, smart-ass comment based on some, something the president had said. And whether they supported him, supported him or not, yeah, making air crew great is a sentiment that members of the air crew probably is a sentiment they can get behind, making them great again. Everyone talks about the flyboys. No one ever talks about the guys on the boat directing traffic and making sure that uh, make sure those jets are in good working order. And yet there were some people who had MAGA hats. MAGA hats, I guess. If you're from the Northeast, MAGA. But um, and there, you know, the president and uh, vice president Pence would go to, you know, you know, Afghanistan, and there would be soldiers showing up on other military bases or the Pentagon. Soldiers showing up wearing MAGA hats, and people were making a big deal. And yeah, I, I make, a, I can kind of, I can definitely see where they're coming across as it's not. Not that good of a statement as far as if you're trying to remain apolitical. I mean, if I was still in the service and I was going to be attending an event where Donald Trump was going to be there, like if I was deployed and, hey, we're going to go to Kabul and we're going to go see President Trump, guess what? We're going to be in uniform. Not a whole lot of civilian clothes that goes with you when you are on deployment. But I wouldn't be wearing a MAGA hat. In fact, I'd probably be uh, confiscating them from any of my soldiers who may have decided to take one. That's neither here nor there. I would be respectful and observant, and I would obey what the policies and regulations when it comes to endorsing political candidates are when it comes to attending these things. And again, it's one thing if you're if you're deployed and you go to a rally because you know the president or the vice president is going to be there. It it's another thing if you know you're back home or even if it's an after-hours thing, if you're stationed in Germany, Korea, Italy, any number of places around the world, it's an after-hours event, and you can show up in civilian clothes. Show up in civilian clothes. It's it's not that big of a deal. You now, maybe this major was on her way home from... Uh, whatever duty she she had, perhaps she was at training. Perhaps she's a you know a full time National Guard officer. They exist. You know the, the it's called a AGR Active Guard Reserve. Perhaps she's one of those. Maybe she was a federal technician. If you are a federal technician with a Missouri National, well, for my case, it'd be the Missouri National Guard, but. Any National Guard, if you are a federal technician, you still show up in your duty uniform, even though you are technically a civilian employee. But whatever, she perhaps she was on her way home from whatever her duty was that required her to be in uniform, and she stopped by the rally. Okay, I don't think the rally was just something that popped up. I mean, I'm I can look through the task and purpose article, and in the background the pictures it has you know they have the uh they have those poles that have the retractable 
like two inch straps that you pull out and you lock into the next pole that they use for, you know, setting up uh, queue lines at movie theaters and theme parks. So pretty sure it was a planned event and it just wasn't, oh, well, she's, it's suddenly here on the way home. She could have planned ahead, brought a change of clothes. But honestly, I really don't think, punishment wise, I don't think anything is going to come out of it. She's not going to get Gomar or a general officer memorandum of reprimand. She that's not going to that's not going to you know taint her military career. I think she's just, they're going to do an investigation, and at the end of the day, she's going to get a strongly worded letter from her commander that says, "You know better than this. Don't do it again." And if she gets punished, she gets punished, and if, but it's going to be minimal, especially being a being a field grade officer such as she is, it's all go- it's going to get swept away, and she's going to walk away from the situation eh, pretty much unscathed. Maybe just a you know little reddening on the back of her hand where they swat her. <laughs> Don't you do that again, young lady. But again. That's life in the military, where if you're a private and you do something, you're going to have the book thrown at you because you need to be taught a lesson. If you're a senior NCO or a commissioned officer, yeah, more than likely they're just going to be like, "Oh crap, we like Bob. We can't, we can't, we can't hurt Bob. I mean, Bob's been around forever. He's Bob." But you know. It's going to come down to the in, the intrastate politics of the South Carolina National Guard and how well they like her. Honestly, it's what that's what's going to boil down to. Is she a troublemaker or does she get her job done? If she gets her job done with her uh, with I think she's a sig- in a signals unit. If she's able to do her job in the signals unit and she's effective she's honestly not going to see anything of it and you already have people within the National Guard coming out saying she led 130 troops as a company commander in Afghanistan you can't punish her for a little oversight technically they can because you know, regulations are regulations. Or, but then again, I've watched people who should have who should have been punished under UCMJ walk away because whatever it was they did was just swept under the rug. And oh well, we like him. We we can't be punishing him because well, we like him. Oh, uh, it's dumb, but so is life in the military. All right, so sticking with the whole military theme here, going into the next story. Um, so... Uh, came out earlier this week that Donald Trump had the audacity to up, or not necessarily Trump, but his administration had the audacity to go and make it to where children of service members or federal employees who were born overseas they wouldn't automatically be citizens and their parents would have to apply for citizenship for their children. Well, remember how I said in the first segment that I was going with the task and purpose story. Don't worry. I'll come back to it again. uh, The first story I saw it was it was shared by Business Insider, 
but it was originally written written up in task and purpose. And what is typically almost like a a a trade a trade magazine for our military, regardless of branch. It is an article. It seemed like they were trying to foment discontent within the chain of command with a story designed to pull at the heartstrings and to anger U.S. forces stationed overseas because they may happen to have a family or start a family while they're overseas. And why would we want to serve in the military and be overseas if if, if the presence is going to make it to where if we have a kid, you know, that kid's not going to be a citizen. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, oh what, what are we going to do? Which basically boils down to there's, a, there's an author at Task and Purpose who doesn't like the president. Again, no one associ- not everyone associated with the military is 1,000% conservative, whether it's a writer for say, Task and Purpose, Military Times, uh, the Stars and Stripes, if you're getting those while you're deployed. There's nothing that says they have to be conservative. I remember going to pers- the Post Personnel Office at Fort Knox to get assistance with paperwork so I could clear. And I walked to her cubicle, and it was a, a shrine to Barack Obama. Again, this goes back against to the Hatch Act story I did in the first segment, but that's neither here nor there. So anyways, what this story was putting out was that it was nigh impossible, or will be starting at the end of October, to have your children declared U.S. citizens if they're born abroad while you're serving overseas. Well, the only problem with that is the fact that it's not true. The fact of the matter is maybe 100 soldiers per year would fall into this and well let's say say soldiers but soldiers and federal employees would fall into the category of their child does not qualify for automatic citizenship and for some reason I, I, I had the counter argument pulled up on reason oh here we go it was actually coming from reason. Military kids born abroad are not being denied citizenship. Well, again, this goes back to the president, uh, the administration. They put out they're making an update to policy, which is you know their prerogative and their you know kind of the responsibility. You don't want to use outdated guidelines that don't apply to the modern, you know, modern world. We're only using guidelines from the, you know, late 19th century concerning, you know, ship manufacturer regulations. Uh, We'd still be sailing in wooden ships today. But, again, our... I'm going to call this a reading from the Reason article that is a takedown of the original pieces that came out by NBC, Task and Purpose, and shared by other media organizations that were ready to jump on the uh, jump on the Orange Man Band Orange Man Bad Bandwagon. Wow, I can't talk. To, I need more coffee. That's my problem. I need more coffee or bourbon. Maybe both. Bourbon in my coffee. That would be amazing. But, all right, reading from the article, 
file under not a good change, but not nearly as bad as we were initially told. No, the Trump administration won't start making members of the military jump through special hoops to get citizenship for any of their children born abroad, despite early bungled reports that this was the new U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, USCIS, policy. Quote, As of October 29th, children born to U.S. service members outside the U.S. will no longer be automatically considered citizens, end quote tweeted NBC reporter Ken Delanian yesterday afternoon. Of course, this article is from a couple days ago, from the 29th. So this is tweeted on the 28th. Parents will have to apply for citizenship for any kids. Such a shift would have been weird and worrying and outrageous, but it turns out Delanian and others got it wrong. Correction, he tweeted about an hour after his initial tweet. Experts who have looked at the new USCIS policy says it applies if a service member adopts a child overseas, but children born to service members on deployment will still automatically get citizenship. And it's also a little bit broader if you are a permanent resident of the United States, but not a U.S. citizen, or or should I say you and your spouse are permanent residents or even temporary residents who are one of one of which is serving in the military. You're stationed overseas. Say you're a super high speed. You join the army. You go to airborne school and they send you to Vicenza, Italy. If you are not a U.S. citizen, when that child is born, guess what? That child is not a U.S. citizen, which is as it's always been. But basically, the best way to sell, to really put the story into where it belongs it was more of an update to policy. Not necessarily we're changing policy. It's just an update. We're making it more in line with State Department guidelines. Which, basically, if you qualify as a civilian traveling abroad and you have a child, you can still request or take the uh, birth certificate from whatever hospital or whatever nation you're in. And you can go to the consulate and say, I had a baby here while I was in this country. We want to go ahead and do their citizenship stuff. And that's the way it's been for U.S. military. I mean, 2017, seeing 2014, 2011, 2003 being deployed and seeing commercials about, well, we have a child that is born overseas. How do we make sure that child has citizenship? Because, you know, things can get lost in the shuffle and your your kid might go 18 years without having ever having a social security number issued because you didn't know the policy or you didn't know what hoops you had to go through to ensure all that got started because your kid was born in Germany, in Italy, in Japan, Australia, wherever you happen to be stationed at the time. Like I said, this it's, it's nothing really all that new. I think uh, the biggest thing it affected was foreign adoptions. You and your spouse are stationed in Poland and you adopt a Polish baby. Guess what? Your Polish baby, they'll get their green card. They'll be able to immigrate to the United States with you. It's just they'll have to be naturalized. That's the biggest thing. Or if, again, you and your spouse are 
legal residents of the United States of America and you have a child while stationed overseas, not only do you have to complete your naturalization process, your child also will have to be naturalized. That's nothing new. That's the way it's been for quite a while. However, just because the USCIS decided they were going to streamline the guidance, it turned into an, oh my God, orange man bad. It's the Cheeto Antichrist. And it's the people just looking for another reason to go, Donald Trump is bad. Do you love what you hear on the Relentless Staring Podcast? Do you want to show the world your support for this podcast? This is Tyler from the Relentless Daring, asking you to go to shop.spreadshirt.com slash Relentless Daring and check out our merchandise there. We have t-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee cups, travel mugs. Go there, check it out, use it to show the world your love of this podcast. And as always, stay relentless. Alright, getting back into it. Um, so one of the stories I was talking about was uh, a religious vindication story. This is a story coming out of Washington State. Uh, the article's from Fox News. The headline is, High school tennis stars penalized for having wrong faith score religious exemption. As, to sum up the story, you have two children, teenagers, who are part of the high school tennis team. They are Seventh-day Adventists. It's a, a Protestant denomination where part of their, their doctrine is that they recognize the Sabbath on Saturday as opposed to Sunday as 99% of Christian faiths do. And as part of their religious observance on Saturdays is they do nothing that is not worshiping God. And in the case of these two teenagers, when their high school tennis team went to the uh, went to the championship, they would have had to play on a Saturday for their round of competition. Well, uh, the Washington High School Sports... I have to look up here what they call it. Uh, the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association, the WIAA. They ruled that, or their rule was, barring injury or illness, if you could not play on a Saturday, you will be disqualified from the entire, from the entire event. So, the only room they gave you is if you had, again, you were down with the flu, or you broke your leg. Uh, reading from the article, um, the Chung siblings, Joseph, 15, and Joel, 17, both Seventh-day Adventists, a Protestant denomination that observes the Sabbath on Saturday, as recorded in the Bible, sued the Washington Interscholastic Activities Association earlier this month after Joel was disqualified from her final state tennis postseason because she doesn't play on Saturdays. The Chung family, represented by Beckett, a religious liberty law firm, filed a motion to withdraw their federal suit on Tuesday after WIAA agreed to add religious observances to its reasons for missing games without being penalized. What's really bad is that Joelle, she had to miss out on 
and competing for her senior year because, again, there, there was no religious exemption. That is something she will never get back. It, it was rightfully robbed from her in a decision made 50, 60 years ago. Because, really, who's, who's going to choose religious observance over trying to win their championship in their sport. I mean, you can take it take it for what it is. But I, the fact that they weren't willing to make this e- exception, it really does speak volumes. I mean, was it there's the football coach who was told that if you go out and you take a knee or cross yourself, or anything on this football field, you will not have a job, which his case is still being adjudicated. Now I'm pulling for him. And so he went out after the final game of the season. No, with none of the kids, just by himself, walked down on the 50-yard line, took a knee, and prayed. And he was fired. Because why he had the audacity to exercise his faith, someone might see him and therefore by being witnessed as a faithful Christian, he's going to cause someone to be converted and because he's a state employee that would be proselytizing. I... I the, the logical leaps that they have to go through for stuff like that is, frankly, it hurts my head. No, I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm having to, you know, duct tape it together to keep it from flying apart. But it still is like, it makes no sense. And it causes something right, right around the, uh, the right temporal lobe to really start throbbing. But yeah, you know, in this situation, you have the have a girl. She's going to championship, going to the championship, but she can't compete because, at any point of it, because if I have to play on Saturday, I can't. I mean, that's again it goes back to being a head scratcher. But apparently, Washington did do the right thing, and they offered to make the concessions. Yeah. Yeah, uh, reading again from the article, a quote, it's common sense that Sabbath observers shouldn't be excluded from any postseason sports competition at all just because of the hypothetical possibility of a schedule conflict somewhere down the line. And after the rule change, they won't be. And it's it's just silliness that, you know, to do something that's common sense like that, you have to sue? Come on. There, there's so many reasons, especially as a state, where you have to balance, you know, okay, does it make sense? With, I don't even know if I go go with that. Does it look like the state is in, is impeding the rights of its citizens? And if WIAA looks at their actions as a state organization, go, oh, it looks like we're uh, punishing them because they don't worship God on the right day. They're not in the temple on Friday night like the Jews. They're not in church on Sunday morning like every other God-fearing Christian. They're different. So we're going to penalize them. I mean, come on. It, It couldn't be any more blatantly obvious what the right call should have been way, you know, back when it was first made. 
Oh, excuse me. But yet here they are as teenagers. Well, as it, basically the brother is not going to be affected. He's sophomore going on to the varsity team. But again, the daughter was a senior and she had to miss being able to play as a senior. And that's just something, you know, as any student athlete, that's a horrible disappointment to bust your ass for an entire season, maybe two or three seasons, to get to where you have earned a trip to the championship, but you can't compete because... I may go possibly make it through to the finals there on Saturday. But I have church on Saturday and can't participate. I mean, that's just, it, it's asinine. It's, it's completely asinine. And it just, uh, but I will say, there's been more and more stories like this where the state has been egregiously making rulings against and taking actions against religious people, against churches, against the faith community. And through either trying to avoid the public spectacle and being made to look like the jackasses they are, they settle before it becomes goes into the uh, goes onto public record. Or through these through some of these judges. You know, some of some of which have been Clinton appointees, some of them have been Bush appointees, or I don't know if any Obama appointees have ruled this way, but and you know, Donald Trump appointees ruling in favor of you know religious freedom and religious expression. I mean, I I see the world turning around for the better. Or at least some aspects of it, because well, frankly, some of the ways the world is going, it's definitely not turning for the better. It's going deeper and deeper down the crapper. But hopefully with the little victories, we can kind of slow that momentum down and start backing it up and getting, getting us further and further away from the great cosmic septic tank that we've sl- rapidly been falling into. All righty. So last but not least... Getting into uh, the history of Labor Day. And, yeah, even if I had a cheering, you know, an applause line for uh, my soundboard, I wouldn't be hitting it for this. Because Labor Day is a day born out of Marxism. Of course, granted, the, the Marxists, they do have their own day. It is May 1st. A day marked with protesting and sometimes violence. Because that's the only way the left can get these crazy ideas to be absorbed is through forced osmosis and beating it into your brain. But really to understand the history of Labor Day, you have to understand really the history of the labor movement within the United States. Now, yeah, keep in mind, the labor movement started in the late 1800s. 
1870s or so. You know, around the time that Karl Marx. Karl! And Frederick Engels were sitting around in a coffee shop in Paris with a bunch of other notable communists and started working on their manifesto. The thing that has led to over 100 million dead around the world, all at the hands of communist socialist governments. But I digress. But so in the really in the 1860s, 1870s, the labor movement was not organized uh, on the national level. It was all local unions. So, you know, you didn't, it was really hard to get a lot of uh, big policy changes through Washington because, you know, you might have your town's, you know, coal mining union or steel union, what, whatever, whatever it was, but it wasn't affiliated with the one the next town over. Well, then you start getting the peop- start getting into organizations like the was it the AFL, the American Federation of Laborers, who they're the they're the ones who really started to consolidate trade unions into big national organizations, and so. At the time, people, if you worked in a factory or a mine, you worked upwards of 70 hours a week. Which, being a person who does a lot of manual labor, 70 hours a week sucks. But, I mean, that's what was required of you. And through these small local labor unions... They had gotten the hours reduced down to probably a little closer to 60 because business owners were starting to realize, man, our economies suck. Why aren't people spending money? Besides the fact they weren't being paid all that well, but that's, that's another story. But what was it? They realized that through if they lowered the amount of hours people were at work, that gave them more time to spend their wages. If they have more time to spend their wages, they will. And that's going to be an inherent boom for the economy. Their personal economy will get better because, okay, we have this money, we can actually do stuff with it. We can we can buy things with in turn puts money back into the community in some way, shape, or form. And not just being on, you know, you know, being further indebted to the company store where you have to, where you're forced to get everything because you can't buy it on, buy it out in the community because, you know, everything's closed by the time you come out of the mine or you come out of the, uh, the Coke mill. So, you know, wages were coming up, hours were going down, but it wasn't happening fast enough. Because you have to keep in mind, the people who were starting unions, they were progressives. They were people who believed that, you know, we need to take from the bourgeoisie at the, you know, the pinnacle of these companies, the CEOs, you know, the big wigs, the fat cats, and you take from them and get more to the workers. Because, hey, the workers need to unite. Isn't that weird? Almost like several several years later, and you know, you start seeing a lot of red banners that say "Workers of the World Unite." Weird, or that strange symbol on the what would become the Soviet flag of the hammer representing the the uh, the factory workers and the sickle representing the farmers and they unite and take over the 
take control of the destiny of Russia. Oh, man, that's really weird how all that's working out. Yeah, as I was going through and doing my research, one of the things I found was oddly, oddly, uh, well, I might lost words. Yeah, you know, make all these links back to communism. Carl! And one thing I saw was as a poster of somewhat communist iconography. It had a gloved hand that represented the factory worker. A hand where the arm that it was attached to was in a suit. And then a third hand coming and gr- reaching and grasping the two of those as they were shaking. It was, you know, the hand of Uncle Sam. You know, the red, white, and blue coat sleeve. And it's like, huh. That's weird. The labor movement is wanting a this weird partnership between the workers and the management and the government. Wow, that just couldn't be an advertisement for that wonderful system that was they had in Germany and Italy eventually in the 1930s called fascism could it god i've been waiting all night to use that one but yeah i mean early but when yeah came out, when labor day was finally signed as a federally recognized holiday in 1896 thank you grover cleveland even then, it still wasn't recognized as the day you got off work. Oh, is that 1886? Yeah, no, it's 1884. I'm sorry. I'm misreading all my stuff here. But it was 1884. Grover Cleveland signed it into law and made it a federal holiday. 1886, workers who still weren't getting off for Labor Day, or as they like to call it, the Workers' Day... Uh, it's more of that damn communist iconography. Uh, I can't get over it. But as a you know, mass, there were massive strikes and walkouts, riots in the street, cops being murdered, trying to quell these riots. And that's what it took for for you to enjoy your last three day weekend of the summer and you know, your chance to, you know, grill a few burgers, drink a couple of brews with your friends. It it's all rooted in you know this uh, communist ideology of take from the people up top and give more to you, the worker, because the worker, the worker, the worker. The workers' parties are doing this. This is something I thought was interesting. I thought I should should share with you, my dear listeners, here on this wonderful Labor Day weekend. Carl! Oh, yes. That's, That's a new addition to the soundboard. That would be Paul from the webtoon Llamas with Hats calling out his friend Carl for... Some horrible, horrible, atrocious act that he had done. And nothing better than to throw at Karl Marx and his wonderful, wonderful political theory that's left 100 million dead around the world. Karl! All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you so much again for listening appreciate it uh if you follow me on social media on twitter either on my personal twitter at real tyler morgan or on the podcast side at daring podcast or follow me on facebook you know facebook.com slash relentless daring uh you also don't forget 
if you like what you're hearing on the podcast and you want to help me keep it up, right now I'm, I'm finding this out of my pocket. If you want to be a patron, you go to patreon.com slash relentlessdaring1 and become a patron there. Uh, there's multiple tiers. You know, you know there's uh, different things. I don't have them pulled up, so I can't tell you what each each tier would give you. But there's multiple tiers there set for automatic payments every month. It helps keep everything going, helps keep equipment renewed, software updated, and all that stuff. Uh, again, it just helps kind of keep this moving along. Also, uh, don't forget to go to the uh, don't forget to go buy merch at a uh, shop dot spreadshirt dot com slash relentless underscore or no not underscore relentless hyphen daring go there t-shirts coffee mugs you name it ball caps go there help keep it going and folks as always stay relentless <laughs>